uh, led by a team of researchers at Goldsmiths, um, University of London and University of Coventry. And, uh, and Global Grace uh, employed artistic interventions and curatorial research practices and public exhibitions to uh, investigate gender um, uh, and uh, um, cultures of inequalities, uh, bringing together academics and non-academic partners, uh, mostly NGOs in six countries, uh, namely Bangladesh, um, Brazil, Mexico, the Philippines, uh, South Africa, and the UK. So I was working on the project in South Africa, um, uh, which was dubbed as Work Package One, and uh, it engaged with performance and production of cultures of equality among sex workers. Um, uh, we had a colleague in Bangladesh and a team there who worked with uh, working women uh, in men's worlds, visualizing female construction workers and uh, the quest for more equitable futures and select. And uh, my colleague and friend Andrea um, worked in Brazil uh, and the project looked at decolonizing knowledge and doing masculinity otherwise, street art, dance, and the production of cultures of um, equality in um, a Brazilian favela. And we had a team and colleague in the Philippines who worked on making life livable digital and literally productions of cultures of equality amongst LGBTQ uh, young people in the Philippines. And we had a colleague and team in Mexico um, who were looking at curating cultures of equality through the migrant uh, museum, uh, MUMI, uh, in indigenous Chiapas, Mexico. And my friend and colleague Siobhan was based in the UK um, and her project looked at invading spaces, curatorial practice, and the making of a global museum of equality. So the three of us are going to focus on just three aspects of the work. Um, uh, of course, bringing in how uh, we worked with um, or employed or engaged with feminist and queer methodologies in our interventions in uh, the three countries uh, we were best at. So perhaps indeed I'll start and then um, uh, I'll hand over to um, uh, uh, Andrea and Siobhan to, to talk to their projects as well. And I think each of us are, um, are responding to some questions uh, in relation to this in order to carry you um, along the way uh, in understanding this. And my main question that I will be responding to will be in what ways can you do performance as research with a group of street best sex workers who are transgender, queer, bi, cis, hetero, um, uh, and gay, uh, some of whom um, are illegal migrants and who have been historically marginalized uh, in a context uh, like South Africa. So um, in my little blurb uh, that I'm going to talk to you about, uh, this is sort of the main question um, uh, I will be speaking to. And um, just so we keep on board a bit, uh, I might share a couple of slides so you get to, um, let's see, where is it and why is it not? Okay, maybe not. That's not what I want to share, bear with me while I, <laughs> deal with this in a second okay that's the slide I want to share all right there we are okay so this these were the work packages that I was talking to you about and now I'm going to um stampede into um uh, my presentation okay so the project uh, I worked on, as I mentioned, was um, uh, a performance as a methodology employed with to engage with a group of street best sex workers who are um, transgender, queer, bi, uh, cis, hetero, and gay um, over a, a period of three and a half years. So the project, the Sex Workers Theatre Group was formed uh, in March 2019 as part of a collaborative research project uh, within the African Gender Institute where I was based at the Center for Theatre, Dance and Performance Studies. 
um, at the University of Cape Town and the NGO, the Sex Work and Education and Advocacy Task Force, I swear. So uh, what I'm projecting here is... Um, uh, the My NICAR, three, don't let up your left. I'm hearing voices. Sorry, please, can you, can you mute yourself? <laughs> Should I continue? Sorry, yeah, you can continue. I, I muted right. things. Okay. Sorry. All right. So what I'm projecting here is our NGO partner, the Sex Workers Education and Advocacy Task for SWEAT, uh, who really do um, amazing work around decriminalization and destigmatization of sex work. So what you're looking at is the little blab around um, uh, the legal measures in relation to sex work in South Africa. So um, as I mentioned earlier, this was part of the Global Grace Project and in South Africa, our chosen methodology was participatory theater and performance as a means of exploring gendered, sexed, racialized and classed inequalities among sex workers um, in Cape Town uh, in order to contribute to existing discussions um, uh, within public and policy arena um, in relation to uh, gendered inequalities. Uh, the Sex Work Theatre Group was formulated through a selection process um, uh, by professional judges based at the Center for Theatre, Dance and Performance Studies um, after a call for auditions was put out in February 2019. Uh, a call for auditions was circulated through SWEAT. When I say SWEAT, this is the NGO, it's not sweating or working out of any sorts. Um, so SWEAT safe spaces um, and um, uh, Sweat Safe Spaces and Outreach Program that see a number of sex workers gathering to get together. Uh, the auditions took place over a period of two and a half days and were workshopped based on uh, a number of elements. So initially we recruited um, uh, 13 members, but then downsized to 10 due to funding limitations and eventually worked um, uh, with a group or the same group uh, of eight uh, sex workers um, uh, who are, as I mentioned earlier, trans, um, uh, queer, gay, uh, het uh, some heterosexual, cisgendered um, uh, women, and uh, a number of immigrants. So um, that this group was trained uh, over a period of three and a half years, beginning in April 2019, um, all the way through December 2021, when we launched uh, the Independent Sex Workers Theatre Company. And the workshops were set up uh, on different modules set and centered around theatre techniques, namely forum theatre, a physical theatre, um, uh, spoken word and live arts. And each module lasted about three or so months, uh, culminating into um, a public performance. Um, the first module uh, on Forum Theatre was um, uh, directed and facilitated, uh, was facilitated by Delia Mayer and uh, the performance um, uh, that culminated from that was directed by her. Um, and it was based on, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Boal's techniques of theater of the oppressed. Um, the second module was on physical theater and it was facilitated by um, uh, Iman Isaacs and culminated in a performance in um, uh, December, 2019, directed by Iman Isaacs. Uh, the third, um, a performance uh, or training happened during COVID and it was as, uh, mostly based on spoken word and it was facilitated by Jason, um, um, Jason Jacobs, uh, who then directed the final performance. And Iman returned to do uh, the fourth uh, module, which was around masks and live arts. And um, uh, the final performance uh, was uh, um, directed by her. So um, uh, the theatre methodologies worked with derived stories, for, um, lived experience stories from the sex workers themselves, which is what ended up being performed. And so the performances were not on high theatre, so to speak, like on Hamlet or, you know, um, Oliver Twist or something like that. It was based on their lived experiences. 
Um, all members of the Sex Workers Theatre Group offered formal consent to use the material for research purposes, which was uh, revisited. This consent was ongoing, uh, revisited and re-evaluated as we went along. And so practice as research um, or performance as research, um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, according to... Um, uh, uh, Nelson, performances research would probably not have been coined had artists not gotten involved uh, with higher education institutions in respect uh, of programs um, uh, of learning, particularly at PhD level. Uh, yet this does not um, uh, come uncontested as ephemerality of art poses a particular challenge around knowledge production in a positivist sense, uh, which usually um, is measurable and fixed. From a purely positivist stance, performance as research uh, is caught between the ambiguity of method and methodology, but instead of fixating on these unhelpful binaries, one would rather dwell on the ambiguous space between the binaries, which invites um, uh, inventiveness, as Kershaw and Nicholson point out. And because it's perceived as ambiguous, performance as research both traverses and complicates the methodology binary, a method methodology binary. And Kershaw and Nicholson point this to as, uh, point this out as uh, intuitive messiness and aesthetic ambiguity as integral to research in theater and performance, where the relationship between the researcher and the research are fluid, uh, improvised and responsive. This makes it layered in a way it reveals itself in that the research is not predetermined, a predetermined map, but rather a wayfarer. Um, and this is important aspect of uh, a research method in a number of ways. Firstly, it opens up possibilities for interdisciplinarity, both within the creative arts, such as um, dance, drama, music, visual arts, writing, um, uh, um, and beyond, as well as other disciplines, such as public health, gender studies, psychology, sociology, art mentioned, but a few. And secondly, the fluidity improvised and responsive uh, responsive nature of this method highlights the fact that performances research is a praxis, theory imbricated within a practice, as um, or as others call it, intelligence practice or material thinking. And thirdly, the fact that it is responsive in nature, it is embodied, or it embodies a collaborative aspect of both the research and the research as both co-researchers. And so Kasha and Nicholson contend that performance as research is not concerned with legitimizing the cultural authority of the researcher or the research, but rather engage with the socio environment production of systems and cultural production of flexible research ecologies within a tacit understanding um, inferred practices and theoretical assumptions can be made explicit and in turn be queried and contested. So this makes this method appealing for feminist and decolonial scholars in that it speaks to the histories of hierarchies of research or researched and that, uh, that have been um, uh, oppressive in nature historically. In addition, performance as research complicates the binaries and traverses the method methodology, research or research uh, boundaries as alluded to earlier. And like, uh, Performance as research, decolonial praxis calls for disruption of hierarchies or uh, the non modern, as Lugones uh, infers. Uh, for Lugones, the non modern is knowledges and um, relations and values and ecological and economic and spiritual practices that are logically constituted to be at odds or dichotomous um, hierarchical uh, category logic. Um, because uh, performance as research traverses binaries and automatically disrupts hierarchies, uh, which firmly uh, situates in Lagone's uh, stipulation of the non modern. So we worked with performance as research in entanglement with decolonial feminist epistemologies and praxis, noting that there's no single feminist methodology or epistemology, 
but rather multiple lenses uh, that home in, in layers of sexist, racist, homophobic, and colonialist points of view. Uh, moreover, feminist researchers are mindful of hierarchies of power and authority uh, in the research process as articulated by Linda Tuhiwai Smith. Um, uh, decolonial feminists take note of those power differentials embedded within research and have the potential of reinforcing the status quo and enforcing the divisions between colonized and colonized. Uh, this recognition makes the research uh, participants um, uh, uh, a figuration if we're to draw on um, a bridotti in that regard. So for us, it was important to work with this epistemological grounding frame, framed within decolonial feminist frameworks because uh, the research project was working with street-based sex workers in South Africa, uh, noting that uh, South Africa uh, is one of the most unequal societies in the world whose physical geography is a persistent reminder of apartheid's continuing legacy. Uh, these tangible reminders and symptoms of apartheid endure from impoverished townships to the poor conditions of schools, the high levels of violence, uh, to the fact that 80% of the economy and two thirds of the land mass in South Africa is still held uh, in the hands of the white minority. Uh, one of the paradoxes uh, in South Africa is that it's economic, it, economically it holds its own being a member of the G20 and has the second largest GDP on the African continent, yet unemployment rates are soaring and rife, um, I think clocking to about 50 post-COVID. Um, uh, this, this has given grave implications um, uh, on sex workers who are, who are on the margins of the economy. Moreover, South Africa currently lies at the epicenter of the HIV epidemic, uh, which disproportionately aff affects young women uh, aged 15 uh, to 24 years. Um, UNAIDS, uh, which monitors the global epidemic on HIV, notes that uh, the low and middle income country sex workers are 13 times uh, more likely to be living with HIV compared to the general population um, uh, in comparative um, uh, reproductive age. So sex workers are therefore at the center of inequality in South Africa and yet a peripheral community, more so when it comes to the Legal and um, uh, Sexual Offenses Act, which I uh, projected earlier, um, where our criminality is based on this 1957 act, um, uh, which continues to criminalize um, uh, sex work. And of course, this has multiple manifestations in relation to not only physical violence, but structural violence, um, uh, as well as police brutality. Um, so performances research uh, draws on uh, uh, decolonial feminist epistemologies um, uh, was the optimal methodology uh, and method to engage with. This combination of collaboratory methods opens up new possibilities on knowledge production, one um, that is embodied and, and builds cultural epistemologies in such of hidden new knowledges um, as job uh, rights. Uh, in relation to sex work. And this results in production of knowledge that centers the lives and voices of sex workers who are otherwise not seen and heard uh, by prevailing power structures and hierarchy. But most significantly at the heart of this embodied work is the notion of well-being for sex workers. So what job, Jackie Job, uh, who's one of um, a renowned South African dancer and one who actually worked with a theater group um, uh, in one of the trainings, uh, writes this as an building inherited cultural epistemologies rooted in trauma, structural inequality, and violence to produce new epistemologies of healing, of self, um, of those who are constantly dehumanized and neglected by society. Who I'm looking at the time. Um, moreover, um, uh, the collaborative nature of performances, research, um, and decolonized methodologies center the research participant as an agentic subject, uh, both performance and research and feminist uh, research uh, methods are embedded in principles of action research, uh, so to speak. Um, and of course, this um, brings out elements of um, uh, co-creation. 
uh, as opposed to um, uh, just digging for information. And this graph really shows where the inequalities lie historically um, uh, in relation to economic access or wealth. Uh, and the wealth gap is such that um, the 1% um, minority own 90% of the wealth. So what does that mean um, uh, for the rest of the population? Uh, and indeed, um, uh, these are some of the um, uh, issues to pay attention to in relation to decoloniality, uh, being cognizant of histories, uh, uh, centering um, who those who are not in what has historically, who has been historically dehumanized, um, uh, close disciplinarity, um, and of course, questions of representation and knowledge production, which are important, and praxis um, as centered within that. And um, so briefly talking to you about um, how we did it, uh, you know, um, which is what really this talk is about, because uh, that was mostly theoretical framing. Um, so for this, we drew a number of epistemological groundings articulated in Kasho, uh, which speaks to these points. So the starting points, are, um, according to Kasho, says there are numerous starting points in performance as research, but uh, they can be borrowed um, or narrowed down generally to namely um, uh, starting questions to be answered of the problems solved by the proposed project. And secondly, some of the practitioners go by hunches or intuitions uh, that spur them to the root of the starting point. So for us, um, the project was working towards um, the broader frameworks of our NGO partner, which was around uh, decriminalization and destigmatization of sex work. So it wasn't just research, but it, it had these um, activism elements entangled in it. Um, and so in the current stigmatization environment, the health of sex workers and physical uh, and emotional well-being is of concern as I've um, articulated before. So the project wanted to work with these gendered inequalities uh, with a holistic approach to well-being uh, and recognizes the specific demands of the structural environment in which um, our sex workers work. And so the focus was engaging uh, with learning not only from existing initiatives among sex workers, um, but also um, work towards uh, decriminalization and, and destigmatization. And so we had a set, a several, a set of several questions co-created and co-devised together with our NGO our partners and the sex workers themselves. In, in relation to locations, um, all performances uh, are beyond um, by location and space and time. Um, uh, this is what Kasho um, uh, talks to. Uh, for us, because the strong element of social change was embedded within this action research, community engagement and interaction was crucial. Um, and so we chose a community-based theater as a residence theater for um, uh, the entire three years um, uh, where not only the training took place, but the performances as well. And our chosen residence theater was the Theater Arts um, Admin Collective, uh, which um, uh, is found uh, within the neighborhood of the NGO. Um, so the Theater Arts Admin Collective is built on tenants of affordability, inclusivity, uh, accessibility of theater practitioner from diverse backgrounds and across the spectrum of culture, social and economic uh, skills and experience, which is really fit or fitted uh, within our, um, our politics and uh, what we wanted to drive it. Uh, in relation to the aesthetics, um, um, Kasha notes that um, every particular example is imbued with other practices and it's thus integral evolving uh, aesthetic, aesthetic genealogy is always beholden to aesthetic traditions. So for us, we employed a collaborative approach to performance, making uh, the center, um, the body, uh, the main aesthetic driver. In other words, for instance, physical theater, the body was explored and engaged as the main mode of aesthetic expression. 
uh, the choice to employ with the Brody was inspired by the desire to explore non didactic approaches to performance and activism. So the physical theater, for instance, was, um, in, uh, was the form that was engaged um, uh, with unlimited spoken words in favor of the language of the body to convey um, uh, the story and meaning. And it was our hope that it would open up space for audience members to participate in a process of core meaning making where they had agency in, uh, in and over the performance. Um, it was also hoped that the experience would elicit uh, an element of activism uh, from the part of the audience. And the transmissions um, uh, as through time, space and events, um, uh, uh, the means by which knowledge, understanding and insight is produced or communicated um, uh, is always uh, multimodal. Um, and for us, um, the transmissions uh, were delineated in two parts, uh, the generation of uh, material, which was through workshopping um, and the performance, uh, which was uh, the actual going through a rehearsal process and um, performing, uh, refining the stories and performing them. And in relation to the key issues, um, uh, due to the difficulties of various reasons surrounding um, uh, attendance, uh, the facilitator decided was would be beneficial that each performer create individual stories um, uh, that she would then weave together towards the end. Uh, for instance, one of um, uh, uh, so this was mostly dealing with autographical material, which was, of course, challenging and, and traumatic. Um, and uh, so these are some of the elements we had to um, work with in relation to, for instance, holding space. Um, and lastly, um, uh, as we weave this together, um, uh, so if we're to bring in um, uh, decolonial feminism, working towards history of countering marginalization and structural inequalities, um, centering the individual works towards this. This way sex workers were able to tell their own stories using their own um, words or through embodied performances. Uh, for instance, what it means to be um, a young boy um, growing up in South African townships who desires to play with girls and wear girls clothing. So this was Anita's story, a trans sex workers in the uh, sex work and the theater group. Anita tells her own story of her lived experience um, with her own body that speaks to and reveals the complexity of gender uh, 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 in this instance, such as being born uh, in a male body but desiring to be a female and how Anita navigated it in a context with strict understanding and surveillance of gender uh, within a very rigid binary. The sanctions that go with crossing such social boundaries such as those of gender and sexuality. Uh, and some of these sanctions led to Anita living on the streets. Um, uh, she is uh, a homeless sex worker. Um, I know I've run out of time, so I will uh, end there and um, we'll uh, pass over to um, uh, um, and Siobhan, yes, to Siobhan. <laughs> Uh, and then I'll take more questions to talk through after this. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much, Vivi. Uh, really uh, fantastic. So much theory to get thinking with. Um, I am just going to start uh, this. Let's see if I, I can do this. Do, do, do. Now that is, is there a snazzy way to get, uh, to get it to play the presenter view? Can you see that everything, or can you just see the main slide? You can see everything. We see everything, Siobhan. 
Okay, give me one second. I will uh, ding. Okay, now let's try it this way. How about now? Do you just see the main slide now? Yes, that's fine. Fantastic. Yes. Great. Okay, uh, so um, I'm going to talk uh, about a collaborative curation and thinking about how we can use or how we might use um, queer and feminist uh, modalities, methods, theories to kind of uh, shake that up a little bit. And um, as Phoebe has wonderfully introduced, uh, this is uh, reflecting on um, the work that I was involved in as part of the Global Grace uh, project. So as Phoebe described, these were the uh, Global Grace project sites. And in each of these uh, sites, uh, projects that were led by a combination, a kind of collaboration of uh, academics at local universities, staff at uh, locally based NGOs, and uh, interlocutors or participants in projects from local communities took really different forms in, in the different uh, research sites. But in each place, uh, what was going on was a process of uh, creative co-production uh, designed to uh, challenge and produce uh, challenge existing inequalities and produce new cultures of, uh, of gender and uh, intersecting uh, equalities or think at least about how we might push towards those ends um, and so Phoebe's already talked about uh, the project in South Africa and the use of performance um, and we'll hear from Andrea about uh, masculinities and uh, artistic methodologies uh, to explore masculinities in, in Rio. But some of the other projects include using uh, museological or uh, exhibitionary um, processes uh, in, in Mexico to design a kind of a pop-up museum exploring uh, migration and indigeneity and workers' rights. Uh, in Bangladesh, uh, construction workers exploring uh, their rights as, as workers and as women workers. Um, in the Philippines, um, the use of uh, poetry and creative writing uh, to uh, express and explore uh, LGBTQI uh, A plus experience. And in the UK, uh, are carrying out work with uh, women, particularly women of colour, who worked uh, within the museum sector and thinking about how they could use decolonial strategies uh, to, uh, to tell different stories, but also to kind of uh, assert them, them their own self uh, in, in the workplace. And so my job, uh, uh, my heart of my job within this project was to, uh, to uh, work with all the project partners to think about ways in which we might together create exhibitions uh, that um, produced uh, and, and facilitated more than produced, I should say, a transnational exchange, particularly kind of South-South exchange, uh, but to move away from the idea that development projects or, or projects funded through development institutions like our own uh, should be pr promoting any sense of a kind of one size fits all approach to development and or culture change. And that's unfortunately a, the, an approach that still dominates project funding via uh, foreign aid and philanthropic uh, models uh, worldwide. Um, and our emphasis was uh, to uh, look at uh, how knowledge, uh, new knowledges can be co-produced uh, within research sites, but also kind of uh, trans transnationally uh, without this uh, need to kind of go through the expert uh, expert lens um, and therefore moving away from the kind of extractive framework that might be uh, said I think very fairly to uh, characterize uh, tra traditional historic anthropological particularly I'm an anthropologist myself but uh, social sciences in general uh, displays um, of kind of the, the other and this is informed by uh, a model uh, uh, that uh, decolonial uh, and post-colonial thinker Ronaldo Vasquez describes uh, and reminds us uh, as completely uh, not neutral, right? That the traditional museum and exhibitionary space as we know it, the white cube, the gilded building, the national museum, uh, as being an expression of uh, modern colonial power, of epistemic and aesthetic power, one that functions as a tool of exclusion and the erasure of other worlds and other forms of sensing and meaning. So thinking about that and taking that proposition seriously in our first work together, right at the beginning of the project, before we really uh, knew each other, had met each other and worked together, 
we invited uh, Global Grace Project Partners to respond uh, to an invitation uh, to uh, come to our opening conference, carrying with them uh, objects that um, represented their, their research projects that were at that point uh, still kind of just developing and emerging, and to create a series of postcards uh, attempting uh, to subvert the, the device of uh, the picture postcard, which has been sorry, uh, so associated with um, colonial expansion uh, and depictions and representations of the exotic over there, that kind of wish you were here sentiment. And so we wanted to challenge that, look back at that, flip uh, the postcard uh, uh, around and speak back uh, to those uh, kind of uh, histories and, and talk about a different way of um, doing representational work uh, that could bring our, our projects into a conversation, right? So using the postcard, uh, to kind of uh, talk across uh, across borders and transnationally whilst doing that subversive work. And that came together uh, in the production of uh, this exhibition in 2018, Exchanging Cultures of, of Equality. And I'm just gonna touch on a few uh, choices that we made uh, as experiments in, in curation and think through a little bit about um, how, to, how to evaluate those in a productive way, in a, in a kind of, in a queer way, in a feminist way. Um, so one of uh, one of our, our um, motifs or one of our kind of devices was thinking about objects differently, uh, objects that are not trapped in the calcifying uh, glass case that traps objects uh, in time, but one that uh, says that you know the case is open and you can reach in and take out these objects. And in fact, these are objects that are in everyday. Uh, use that are circulating that are uh, important to people that have come uh, and will go uh, from this this uh, temporary uh, museum space because they are uh, always uh, in in use and you can uh, see that we uh, put um, notes uh, highlighting that uh, objects were uh, kind of on their way in or that they were currently in a talk that the objects were, were doing something beyond kind of just being seen and just being uh, doing the representation or the aesthetic uh, work of the the the, uh, the suspended in time uh, uh, material culture that represents uh, a, a culture elsewhere. Uh, you can see here as well that um, we chose to kind of literally and figuratively write on the walls of the academy. So questioning uh, who gets to uh, write and what academic writing can and should look like and uh, prioritizing uh, original languages above above translation. Um, these are uh, examples of uh, the way that we uh, produced uh, postcards, as I described, with uh, different groups uh, choosing different images and, uh, and uh, deciding uh, between them uh, how best to kind of represent their, their own projects. Um, and these are some examples of the ways in which uh, I think uh, groups uh, chose to respond to uh, this kind of play, playing with the kind of colonial gaze, the, his, the legacies and histories of the colonial gaze. Um, two ideas here, one uh, of the refusal to look, the refusal to be seen, uh, the, the child kind of turning uh, away, um, and then kind of a, a, another approach uh, being the uh, indicting uh, game, uh, uh, the, um, the looking back, the returning uh, of, of the colonial gaze uh, to uh, implicate the, the, the viewer, in this case, uh, holding up, um, holding up a, a kind of question and overtly questioning uh, the, the viewer, but again, uh, in the image, uh, and, uh, refusing the translation, so uh, having the translation into English, the facilitation of English language um, readers uh, being secondary uh, to the point of, uh, of, of the, the, the postcard itself, the image on there. Uh, the other experiment that we used was recording conversations uh, between group members about how they chose uh, to put together uh, their postcards. And we played these back uh, through our telephones. Um, this is kind of pre-pandemic, pre so uh, you know, there's a lack of hand sanitizer and face masks here that might be um, anxiety inducing. But uh, this was uh, the idea of being able to pick up the phone and listen into these conversations. Now, I want to emphasize here that these are experiments and um, experiments have to have the possibility of failure, otherwise they are not experiments. And what I want to do a little bit in this talk is to uh, not only identify the things that didn't work so well, 
and the critiques, the very valid critiques uh, that were raised, uh, but to embrace that and think about how that was productive for us. Uh, so in the case of, um, of the postcards, uh, certainly uh, it, was, it, it was questioned and rightly so questioned, uh, is it possible to, uh, to subvert the picture post? card to successfully distinguish uh, new images from this sentiment of uh, looking uh, at uh, material sent from the exoticized over there. Uh, can we move likewise away uh, from the idea of the, the object behind the glass cabinet? Uh, the empty or the temporarily empty glass cabinet was at some points uh, filled, at some points uh, locked. So are there limits to that subversion? Uh, one uh, comment back on the phones was that they weren't loud enough, they weren't suffic sufficiently audible, so it didn't have the desired effect. Another position taken was um, that because they weren't, in, they weren't translated into English, and one, someone, a visitor said to me, you know, what's the point? Which I thought was, uh, on the one hand, uh, was taken by them as an indication of the failure uh, of, of the exhibition uh, to kind of do what, it, what they wanted it to do, but could be read alternatively as a success because they felt excluded from that conversation on the basis of not understanding the language, right? Um, and so I want to think about, uh, about the utility of, of failure, or as Jack Halberstam would say, uh, to understand failure as a queer art, because uh, doing so means that we understand metrics of success as reflecting a, a capitalist heteronormative, and, and I would go further and say a you know, white supremacist as well, uh, idea of, uh, of, of what a kind of uh, success looks like and to be open to the possibility uh, of failure means that we are open to the possibility of the unexpected of new directions of being pushed uh, into truly uh, radical but also potentially uh, more joyful and more celebratory uh, ways of thinking and doing this work and i think a motif that we uh, included in the exhibition actually did, did capture this which was one of uh, crossed wires and we had wires going across the uh, the entirety of the exhibition space i can show you in another image here that you can see these uh, these wires were designed to connect the connecting threads between all the different projects uh, but also uh, would be read as, as wires crossed, as uh, reflecting the challenges of doing transnational work, of doing work across translation, of doing work across uh, different um, uh, perspectives on, on uh, our feminist praxis. And so following uh, Ji Yun Moon, uh, we saw, certainly I saw, uh, that this process as being um, open to failure, generative of the new ideas uh, and, and kind of ongoing, uh, what, what, what Moon would call uh, an open-ended feedback loop, right? And that, uh, for me, opens up this space uh, in which uh, it pulls in everyone involved, right? Including local visitors uh, as co-authors. So all the way from the, the, the project participants and interlocutors who were creating uh, work that was uh, shown in later exhibitions, as we'll see just now, all the way through to those viewers or those respondents who were uh, telling us what we got what we got right and what we got wrong, but also the researchers involved who also felt, um, I think, uh, very, very free uh, to uh, critique back at uh, the work that we were doing together. Um, and our approach uh, continued like this. Um, uh, in in person in some spaces, uh, but uh, also uh, due to uh, the uh, the arrival of the coronavirus pandemic and uh, a consequent funding massive loss of funding, uh, we shifted our attention um, to whether or not we should exhibit at all, whether or not we should continue doing creative. Uh, work at all when there was so much uh, at stake, uh, so many lives uh, at risk, um, and thinking uh, about uh, the importance of, of engaging uh, in work and keeping doing uh, this, this work uh, uh, together. So this is a kind of a shift to uh, online uh, ways of, of communicating, on ways of deciding. And uh, in the end, we decided um, to, to go ahead uh, with continuing uh, this this plan for a final exhibition um, for a number of reasons and I think uh, you know, one of them being a, a chance to exhibit and to share work with new audiences so going beyond the local level where people were uh, were sharing their work more kind of 
uh, uh, more, more freely, but even though uh, some of it was on, online, thinking about how we might use uh, a final exhibition as kind of a laboratory to experiment with what could potentially become a traveling exhibition in the future uh, if, if new funding could be uh, secured, uh, but also to give that kind of an international platform, a more permanent platform online uh, to uh, our interlocutors' uh, work. And that reflected our political uh, education goals as a project overall to really challenge and change how people think um, and speaking back to power uh, in, in London, in that kind of uh, global capital, in the, uh, the, the space where uh, the Global Grace Project uh, money was, was, was held, uh, uh, gatekeeping uh, to an extent, but be able to speak back to that and to challenge back to that. Um, and finally, a chance to uh, continue to collaborate and to keep talking rather than uh, risking uh, kind of flying off in our own, uh, our own orbits. And so this led to uh, the kind of closing uh, exhibition, uh, Dislocating Cultures of Equality, uh, which uh, this is the kind of poster for that we, uh, that we used uh, to advertise it locally. It's an image taken from the, uh, the UK uh, based research with women of color working in uh, major uh, institutions and thinking uh, about the ways in which those institutions are shaped to platform and prioritize a uh, male, white, uh, able-bodied uh, figure as the kind of pinnacle of uh, art, but also the pinnacle of expertise, the body that should belong in the space of a museum, being that of a kind of Michelangelo's uh, David, but one uh, that we you know, sought to topple over um, to kind of uh, tip on its, on its side. Um, and we thought that, that that image, even though it came from the, the, the UK based research project, uh, kind of captured something that we wanted to uh, play with across the whole uh, exhibition of challenging these ideas of normative uh, bodies uh, as, as uh, experts. We also placed uh, the exhibition uh, outside. So uh, pushing further the idea of what it means to work uh, against the academy as being in a public space that uh, was on the campus grounds of Goldsmiths, um, but uh, nonetheless uh, outside uh, writing on the external walls of the academy, but also being publicly accessible, uh, open to the people of uh, Lewisham and, and depth and further afield should they come. Um, and, and being in a space that was multi-use, you can see from one of the images here, uh, kind of using a, a, a tennis court as a framework upon which uh, to, to hang uh, uh, work from uh, our partners in Mexico. This also meant that it could be a kind of COVID secure uh, to an extent, um, but uh, also kind of pushed us away from the fetishization of, of, uh, of objects. So these are certainly not uh, behind glass, uh, glass case, cases. We didn't treat them as precious as like that. And this map here on the left shows uh, how we uh, organized uh, the installations from the six projects not in any particular order, though they're numbered here, so they're reference numbers, um, but uh, this is a reflective of uh, what Maura Riley discusses uh, in uh, her book, Curatorial uh, Activism, as a decolonial and intersectional feminist approach to the organization of space, making uh, uh, circuits rather than uh, linear stories, uh, rejecting the idea of hierarchies and inviting uh, people to move through space in, uh, in multi-directional uh, uh, lines or circuits as they choose. Um, uh, and this, this space was uh, entirely uh, wheel, wheelchair accessible as well, which is kind of very, very important uh, to us to make it as an accessible a space as, as possible. But this organization uh, of, of space in kind of uh, a, a, a circle or a constellation very much follows um, the ethos and example of Enwezor's post-colonial curatorial strategy, which is probably most well known through Documenta 11, in which he argued for emphasizing theory and dialogue between disparate global sites. Um, and though on a very small scale here, hopefully one will be bigger, echoed uh, more loudly on a, on a traveling exhibition uh, scale, uh, uh, reflects this idea of uh, interlocking constellation of discursive domains. And in putting uh, each uh, uh, 
installation together and uh, you know time is very short so i'm just going to uh, uh, pick up on on two um on two uh, installations rather than kind of go through all six um we wanted to uh stay true to um the uh the, the kind of modalities and formats in which people uh, were working so this is uh the the a team in in select who were using photo voice techniques to create a, a platform, a campaign for uh, women's uh, women's rights, uh, for them very important to um, to frame their work as fine art, to kind of elevate uh, their, their their work. So in this case, we would not put it on a uh, on a tennis court edge, but instead uh, try and find ways of reflecting that that um, kind of more gallery style framing that speaks back to their own choices in creating a virtual exhibition space and a traveling exhibition as the bottom um, uh, bottom left photo shows here in Kolkata. And so just to give you an example of, of this, um, we, we, we put these uh, images behind uh, the glass casing, but in a way that uh, showed the reflection of uh, the people uh, viewing it. And so uh, implicating themselves or inviting them to see themselves and consider themselves uh, in, in these stories. Uh, we uh, used um, bricks, uh, building blocks uh, as, as part of a gesture uh, towards uh, the con uh, construction work of the women, but also uh, in this metaphorical uh, stance as they, they took in the naming of their work as laying foundations of constructing, of building, building towards something. Um, the manifesto uh, here reflecting uh, the women's uh, agency and their, again, refusal of this kind of uh, pitying gaze, but more of assertion of political, political uh, will. Um, and I'm very mindful uh, that I'm, I'm running out of, of, of time. Uh, so let me think about what I want to emphasize as, uh, uh, okay, uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, taking, picking up from where, where Phoebe, maybe speak back to Phoebe's example, uh, SWEAT, uh, the Sex Workers Edu Education and Advocacy Task Force, uh, their use of street art um, pictured uh, here, uh, interventionist uh, uh, street art to kind of capture and interrupt the passerby to make them kind of reconsider their ideas about sex work and sex workers, as marrying that uh, with the performance-based and the performance and narrative uh, storytelling um, techniques of, of the team in South Africa, uh, which in, in one activity, uh, previously described by Phoebe as well, so well um, involved the creation of, of body maps. And so in creating this exhibition, we kind of married those two ideas together and created this kind of uh, interruption of, of space in a similar way that put forward uh, the, the voices um, and the artistic um, contributions of, of, of uh, the, the theatre company, um, but in ways that uh, kind of were, were designed to interrupt passers-by and not be that kind of fine art framing uh, that we saw uh, from Select. And these two, these two, um, uh, these two installations were placed quite close to each other, emphasising the, the approaches they both took, the feminist approaches they both took towards uh, work and labour, even though they were talking in de very different rubrics uh, about very different uh, struggles for recognition that at some point um, actually uh, kind of contrasted and competed and we can maybe talk about that a little bit late, later on um, because uh, the, the construction workers uh, manifesto included the desire, the demand for an ID card specifically so that they would not be identified as, as sex workers as an officialdom uh, to their labour and so I think it's really important not to shy away from these uh, kind of different uh, opinions in these kind of projects and to have that as a productive uh, conversation. Um, and uh, we we included feedback loops, as, as I said, to kind of continue this idea of collaboration and uh, and uh, and uh, conversation in this kind of open ended feedback loop kind of kind of thinking. And hopefully this will lead to continued uh, exhibitions and continued conversations like the one we're, we're having now. So I just want to close. Um, by uh, uh, picking up on uh, Nora Sternfield's position uh, in a speculative future essay written before uh, the coronavirus and pandemic had entered the kind of global lexicon, but uh, after the election 
of Bolsonaro to the presidency in Brazil, and uh, Sternfield thinking about the possible future of a paramuseum that might emerge from a far right led uh, authoritarian political climate in which activists had addressed, critique, infiltrated, and even occupied museums as part of their own efforts to decolonize the institution. And she reminds us that this kind of work can be very important um, because the politics of history is a kind of politics, and because it creates space for remembering which enables other struggles, even if we do not know what to do with that knowledge yet, or in what direction that work might take us. And so that's the ethos uh, that kind of really, I think, captures what we were trying to do and what we hope to uh, continue doing. I'm sorry I've been a bit long there, uh, but I look forward to uh, the continuing conversation. Thanks, Jovan, uh, for, for the presentation. Thanks to Phoebe as well. I give the floor, um, I give the floor now to Andrea, but I'm so sorry, I will ask uh, Andrea if you could, um, make it like 15 or 20 minutes but very maximum because we really want to to keep time for um the q a um session um and i didn't want to cut the yeah and yeah i didn't want to cut the presentations but i hope um i hope it's it's okay for you uh to make it really maximum to between 15 and 20 minutes mm -hmm. um thank you i give you the floor now Thank you. I'll do my best. Good morning here from Rio. Good afternoon. Good evening um, to you there. Everyone's hearing me well. I was having some internet problems. Good. So first of all, thanks so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you today and with my colleagues of these last number of years of the Grace Project. And to be able as well to open up a space to reflect on a dimension of our work as academics that so often gets relegated to a limited technical sphere, yeah, method and methodology. Yeah, and in, and in these ways, it ends up not getting the kind of attention it deserves as a fundamental transversal aspect of our day-to-day -day work. So I hope to contribute to these conversations today from the places within which I work in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, Brazil. Um, and experiences of collaboration across North-South uh, divides. Uh, I will be bringing some experiences uh, from the, the Global Gaze Project in Brazil, but also its afterlives. So taking a bit of a step back to reflect on how these processes reoriented our approaches to uh, methodology in a more general way, and perhaps begin to pose some questions for our dialogue here today. Um, so that said, I also hope to contribute from a place that continually seeks to articulate research, teaching, and what we call here extension or community outreach. Uh, so in, in these 15 minutes, I'll try to um, bring some of these experiences that cut across these institutional spaces in ways that help us reposition the debate on method and methodology within a feminist and queer ethos. So I wanted to start off um, by asking ourselves really uh, questions like what does it mean to talk about feminist and queer methodologies what kind of work does it require what kind of infrastructure what kind of relations what kind of dispositions are called for so I'll try to get into some of these questions in my initial talk uh, specifically bringing in the kinds of questions rather than answers that we uh, sort of multiplied through the Brazilian work package of the Grace Project um, but also start to think about or rethink about uh, intellectual activism and how we go about knowledge production processes, especially from within the peripheries of the global political economy of knowledge. So I wanted to quickly, I realize we don't have so much time, but I wanted to quickly take a moment of collective pause um, to take note of our starting points and potential points of dialogue and to align our language as well, specifically as I don't circulate in uh, European and feminist and queer spaces. So just to get a feel for what method and methodology means to you. Um, so I'd like to invite you to jot down in the chat, in the Zoom chat, just the first word that comes to mind uh, when we say feminist and queer methodologies. So just take a minute uh, and jot down um, so that we can see where we're at and maybe uh, start to think about uh, points of connection for our conversation. So 
So I'm seeing a lot of different words coming out from action, compassion, co-creation, intersection, activist research, intersectional, uh, norm critical, that one I'm not so familiar with, knowledge, innovation, inclusive, compassionate, reflective, lots, wow, there's so much coming in there. It'd be great to save this chat later to take a look. When I do this exercise with my students here in Brazil, it's it's impressive um, the kinds of words that tend to come to mind, right? So um, I'm speaking to experiences of giving the mandatory methodology classes in the department that I teach, which is of international relations. And when I ask this question, usually the responses begin with a big sigh, lots of tension in the room. And the words that we tend to map on the board tend to be words like limitation, uh, formulas, techniques, rigidity, imposition, and perhaps the least heavy word that came up at the beginning of this semester when we did this initial mapping was cake recipe. <laughs> but that gives this image of you know, what we're talking about when we're talking about method and methodology and teaching ends up being almost like a mirror for us to rethink our own uh, formation uh, in these processes, right? So in this context, I myself came to understand methodology, and this is something that became really concrete through the Global Grace projects here in Brazil, um, essentially as a process of reflection and self-reflection of research processes. Uh, in that way, understanding research is something that cuts across all of our work, sort of within and beyond classrooms and in communities. So research is more as a means to an end in that sense. And to undo the, the rigidity of my own formation in methods, I approach this conversation as a process that enables us to turn explicit all that tends to be implicit in our work. So to rethink the names that we give to things, to ask the how question, as Phoebe put it. And when we look at how something comes to be rather than what something is, our perspective effectively changes, right? So in this way, I understand method as transversal something that we need to attend to from the early stages of formulating research questions and problems to uh, writing and the communication of what is produced. So reflecting on the how question of all of these actions opens up rather than limits or closes or imposes uh, uh, limits on our work. Yeah, and it leads us to questions. It's something that we uh, were constantly sort of putting up for debate through our own uh, research action projects uh, is sort of who and where are our archives, our systems of reference, our interlocutors, our inspiration, our publics, our audiences, you know, how do we connect with collective agendas and social movements? Um, so with this, the shift that's been central um, and that uh, was the, the driving force of our project here uh, was to uh, understand um, or to put in, in the center of a conversation about our method of how we do things, uh, the question of power and power asymmetries. So often methods training focuses on epistemology, on ontology, definitely in our curriculum, we have lots of philosophy of science and so on, um, which of course has its place. Uh, and yet what's proven to be most useful in our research processes is, is to look at the politics of methods. So that's the relationship between power and knowledge. And in that, we get to recenter method in a discussion of methodology, right? So focus on practice, on negotiations, on dilemmas, uh, on the for what and for whom of our research, a question that we always come back um, to rethink our ethics, for what and for whom a certain research is, is being done. Um, and then we end up having to deal with a lot of dilemmas, not so much problems with easy solutions, but political and ethical dilemmas, um, and the necessity to position ourselves and decide how to proceed. Uh, so in this sense, you know, I'm, I'm one of our, uh, our guiding references here ends up being uh, one of the ways that Patricia Hill Collins talks about intellectual activism in the book of the same title that uh, uh, brings together some of her uh, more uh, uh, recent contributions. And essentially in this, in this book, she uh, talks about intellectual activism as the capacity to speak to multiple publics. So to become fluent in multiple languages of power and resistance and in circulating across spaces, we can better tune our strategies of engagement and uh, disengagement. So it's a very relational uh, and contextual way of understanding uh, method and methodology. So now I'm gonna jump into some of these relations and contexts uh, uh, in terms of the, the Global Grace Project here in Brazil, where we experimented with a number of formative and educative methodologies 
both to further the construction of collective agendas of research, of knowledge production, of social transformation, as well as a means to the end of our own research project. So in this way, we understood our roles as researchers, as kinds of cartographers who sort of accompany processes and along the way, remap and reconstitute the fields of our research action. So in order to create the infrastructure necessary for these relations, we began to create uh, artistic residencies as spaces of self-initiated and collective research uh, through multiple and creative languages and supports. And in this way, creating space for our marginalized subjects to experiment ways of identifying and analyzing the problems that cut across their lives and their activism, especially in terms of racial and gendered violence, um, and uh, begin to propose ways of dealing with it. Um, so I'm going to share here some of our, our productions and processes. I'm going to share the screen. Are you following my screen here? Can you see it? Yes? Okay. Thank you. Um, so it, to kind of give an idea of when I talk about infrastructure, I'm talking about infrastructure in a very concrete and practical way, right? So it's the creation of spaces and conditions uh, for people to become researchers of their own realities and us as researchers accompany this process. So this was our main space in Mare, which is one of the peripheralized favela territories in Rio de Janeiro, where we did this project. Uh, and within these spaces, we were able to essentially um, create uh, each semester different residencies with a collective uh, research agenda. This one that you're seeing here that I accompanied closely was uh, masculinities in dialogue. Uh, methodolo methodologically speaking, you know, we understand uh, action research for those who have um, some experience in, in, in this area as much more than participant uh, observation, um, but rather a process of where researchers have specific roles in constructing, uh, in this case, uh, the residencies, right? So a goal that's beyond the research uh, itself. And the academic researchers as such don't set the agenda, but accompany the collective construction of the agendas you know, in different ways. So to be very practical, concrete about it, when we're talking about ah, what were my final contributions as researchers, because we always have to, for funders, as they say, um, do that kind of uh, account of products and impacts and so on, right? Um, so to help visualize, you know, we're talking about everything from articles and book chapters that systematize the process and propositions developed collectively to what tends to be understood as non-academic products, such as artistic catalogs, uh, toolkits for NGO, the syllabi of the, of the school and the residencies that we end up creating. And of course, along the way, any other contribution that I myself and other researchers were well positioned um, to make. Yeah, so um, we got a chance to reflect a bit on this process uh, through uh, a book that a lot of us were involved with, that uh, Phoebe and Siobhan also contributed to this book that uh, reflected on uh, the process and methodological questions of our, our work. Um, and uh, re-looking back at this uh, book, which was, the, you know, sort of uh, the moment of reflecting on the project as a whole, I wanted to bring out three questions um, that sort of came up uh, at the end of the project um, for us to rethink uh, our lessons, methodologically speaking, for other action research projects. So um, I jotted them down here, you know, in my particular contribution, thinking about uh, decolonial cartographic methods and action research, um, three big dilemmas, three questions came up. The first one is uh, that I want to actually pose in case, you know, it connects up with some of the dilemmas and questions that you face for our dialogue time here. So the first is, you know, what uh, use is it to collectively forge the terms of an action research project if its interpretation remains in the hands of those sanctioned by the academy to produce knowledge to begin with? So that was the first question that, uh, of course, came up along the way. We worked so hard to create these collective infrastructures so that uh, all of our research collaborators were able to um, become researchers of their own uh, agendas. And at the same time, you know, when we're talking about translating and communicating uh, the research at large, it seems that this process of uh, interpretation uh, uh, remains in the hands of the few uh, sanctioned in the academy. 
right? The second question that came up uh, reflecting on the project of the whole is what would it be like to theorize in ways grounded in the proposed action research agenda? So sort of the implications of the first question, you know, how can we uh, theorize in ways where we're not uh, uh, interpreting or analyzing at a distance uh, some kind of collective action, but can bring in our collaborators in the process of theorizing as, a, as an action, as a verb, yeah? And the final question that came up in these reflections um, that we uh, sort of sewn together in the book is in what ways can we approach our, um, or in what ways can our approach to research resist its capture as product and retain its processual and interventive character throughout all stages of production. So I wanted to share some of the questions um, that uh, uh, recurrently came up um, and sort of the lessons methodologically speaking from our experience uh, here uh, in Brazil, and then share with you one of the ways that we try to deal with this. Um, so uh, all of the uh, um, uh, teams that Phoebe uh, and Siobhan also referenced beginning uh, work together at the end of the project to produce an online course and an online museum. And I'm just going to take a few, two or three minutes just to close up and give this example and then open up for, for our dialogue. Yeah, so what we decided to do is instead of transmitting our research findings uh, through the courses and the museums, we approached it as a process of sharing the research process or the research method and understanding this itself as knowledge. And so in our opening module here that you'll see, A Body That Thinks, Corpo Que Pensa, uh, was a module that we created together with our residences. And it was actually just, uh, it started as a warm up exercise one day that one of the residences, Aish Gamayara, uh, proposed for us to do, uh, for us to start to align body, mind, and spirit. So she started, um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, guiding us through processes of uh, moving from our feet to our legs, to our arms, to our head, uh, in ways that connected up with certain ideas of what uh, uh, our women's movements, what our men's movements, and what our person movements. And at every moment, we had to sort of uh, realign uh, how what we think, you know, is a woman's way of walking, a man's way of walking or moving. Um, and in that way, also, beca it became very evident, not only the processes of stereotyping and what the residents called sort of gendered boxes, but also how we're always already in excess of these boxes and how these disconnections create um, breaches through which we can subvert um, gendered norms. Um, so this is an exercise that I wanted to bring this example because it shows us how uh, an embodied or incorporated methodology can work in research. And so we're talking about research, the, 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 the residence processes of researching sort of the problems of gendered and racial violence that they face, but also our own, um, us who are situated within the academy to rethink how we produce knowledge in embodied and incorporated ways. How do we go beyond sort of the self-presentation of ideas and sort of a rationalized way of understanding gender norms and connect up with um, the uh, sort of embodied uh, processes so that we can methodologically speaking, train the disposition necessary to listen and speak and create concepts anonymous, autonomously in relation to others who are also generating these processes autonomously. So this requires that we as academic researchers give up the role of mediators or translators of non-academic knowledge into the academy and assume what we understand within decolonial cartographic methods as accompanying processes and inhabiting territories of research. So to facilitate this reflection and self-reflection of the research process, that initial definition that I gave for how we've been thinking about methodology, I personally use quite a lot of the WhatsApp group with myself <laughs> to register through text and voice notes and image and links, um, uh, everything that cuts across the inhabiting of our research fields, and that allows us to proceed in aware and more self-aware ways. So I hope that in this time that we have here together still today, that we can share some more of these strategies and reflections, how we concretize a lot of those ideas that you put in the chat um, so that we can uh, effectively um, politicize our conversations around method and methodology and work toward aligning as well. Um, our ideas, our practices, um, when we actually begin the work that's uh, required. So thank you so much for your time.
Many thanks, Andrea. Uh, many thanks to the three of you for these very interesting presentations, which really complement each other very well. Uh, so we have about uh, 10 minutes for discussion. Maybe we can extend it to 15 minutes for those who can stay a little bit more. Uh, so you can raise your hands to ask questions or ask them um, in the chats. Yes, Holly, Holly B. Hi, thank you. That was really, really fascinating. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, a couple of different aspects of the project to work out in the first one. Um, dealing with like personal trauma and representing very like difficult or traumatic experiences. Um, and you've also talked about this creation of an environment where you research yourself and kind of self-discover. And I was wondering if you could could speak a bit more to kind of the safety aspects of that and how you managed to um, to, to basically work with participants in a way, I guess, that didn't uh, create a lasting negative effect. Um, I've not done any kind of work with, uh, I'm a PhD student now, I've not done any kind of work of like deep trauma and, and sort of the, the types of subjects that you're handling, but I'm, I'm curious about it because I've done some interviews that the participants came back describing as therapeutic and I'd had a lot of conversations with my supervisor about being quite careful to not be therapy and I'm, I'm kind of intrigued about like that line between that self-discovery journey and, and also it being safe and having sort of certain boundaries around like what your own expertise as a researcher is. Um. Holly, maybe can you just uh, because at the beginning of the question where really was really um, not high quality of sound, so maybe if you can just oh, sorry. Um, repeat the very beginning of the of the question. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. I, I um is that better? Is that okay? My microphone's not great. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask about um, you worked a lot with 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 personal trauma and self discovery, and I wondered if you had any uh, thoughts on how you could do that safely, and and kind of find the boundary between this quite therapeutic exercise because it is about self-discovery and also kind of recognizing that this is a research environment and not necessarily a therapy environment and and being sensitive to that who wants to take that <laughs> um i mean um sometimes we think uh, we're doing research in a vacuum <laughs> um, and that we're separated from <laughs> real life uh, in a sense. Uh, that's a complicated uh, dynamic, um, especially when there are multiple levels of violence, uh, both um, uh, in the physical sense or material sense and structural sense. So there's no, I guess, clear answer uh, in relation to uh, keeping safety, but I, I think we found um, having a close network of uh, colleagues. Um, I mean, Andrea knows <laughs> uh, we sort of had quite a bit of banter uh, with um, uh, Siobhan and Andrea as well. Um, I guess through such conversations, um, as well as with fellow colleagues, um, uh, it's ways of um, making meaning or sense of um, uh, the so-called and safety uh, uh, that might result uh, uh, from the research processes. Um, but yeah, there's no uh, clear <laughs> divide or boundary because you know we we are people living with people doing research about people, so that separation is really difficult. <laughs> That's my little uh, take on that. Uh, Perhaps, yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry. Well, I was going to say, uh, first of all, apologies, I've had to move space, I've uh, had to change rooms. Um, so hopefully you can hear me okay in the background echo isn't too bad. Um, but I think one thing that certainly came up uh, in, in my research um, was the unexpected uh, sources of trauma that we can't, uh, we can't anticipate all the time what questions, what uh, memories people are going to um, tap into that they might find very difficult or challenging. Um, and that's something kind of, I think, to always be 
uh, to, to try and be ready for, but not presume that we can anticipate. Um, there's, there's something that comes up, I think, in my teaching as well. Uh, so when wanting to prepare students with kind of content notices or, or trigger warnings, um, also being mindful that uh, people might have experiences uh, that, that, that you don't, don't anticipate uh, to be traumatizing, uh, but certainly, certainly are. Um, and that can be um, someone kind of suddenly remembering that uh, someone, uh, that, that, they, that they were in a museum storeroom in the past and uh, picked up what they then discovered were human remains of people that they felt could be their ancestors. And that, and that being a, a story that they weren't anticipating or haven't prepared to tell in an interview or an oral history session, uh, but nonetheless be kind of very um, upsetting for them. And being, uh, being able to pause and spend time and I think put aside your research questions uh, in that moment is really uh, important. And, and you know, the people that we work with have always given them their time to us. And so I think that as researchers being able to, to give our time back is really uh, important, uh, and even if it hits us in unexpected spaces and times. Andrea, do you want to, to, to add something? Uh, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> We've almost lost the habit of Zoom here. <laughs> Luckily, I'm more in presence. Um, so taking off a bit from where uh, Phoebe and Siobhan were saying, I think that this um, shift to decentering uh, the researcher and the researcher's agenda is actually a way of opening up a lot of possibilities for dealing with um, uh, the violences that inevitably will be reproduced uh, within our research fields. Uh, one of the ways that our project ended up dealing with that was whenever possible to when we create spaces where these questions could emerge, um, that we would bring in peers to facilitate that session and we would be there um, accompanying these processes, but we would not be the ones that would be leading these processes. So to connect up with the question that was put in the chat of working with LGTB youth in the schools, um, I think that's, a, that's another way to go is whenever possible, um, understand that our role sometimes is to create infrastructure and not to protagonize the process and that um, the more that we immerse ourselves in our research fields, the more um, that we will have the dis develop the discernment necessary to know when, where, um, with whom uh, to raise certain questions or not to raise certain questions. Um, so that's one way that um, we've uh, worked that and of course that uh, awareness and self-awareness of your own positioning in relation to your collaborators is also a uh, key to sort of understand. So uh, I think in a way to have a, a bit of faith that um, whatever we experience and um, accompany will in some way inform our research and that it doesn't necessarily need to uh, follow a script. So this workshop, more workshop based method, you know, thinking about the school context as well, something we do a lot, right, where you start mapping out. So what, you know, uh, what is it to be a woman? What is it to be a man? What is it? And then start to, you know, uh, play with what they bring, you know, or the exercise that um, I shared with the, in the course, right, that actually doesn't require people to get so caught up in their self images, right, and can um, uh, connect with their own movements, right, so when they're asked to walk like a man or talk like a man or walk like a woman, work like a woman, you know, and then through that they themselves will start to perceive certain things. So I, I, I was trying to actually think of the two questions in, in one movement because I think they're really connected for us, um, but maybe what connects up, you know, what um, uh, uh, what these two questions have to offer really is to rethink the role of the researcher in this process. Thank you. Any other question? I'm just going to uh, add to, and I think Andrea made the, a fantastic point now, and just to, in the case with the with young people, uh, but with any people, but in, in the LGBT uh, case in Norway, asking asking people if you were going to do research, what would you ask? What would you like to learn? What are your questions? And, and having that be uh, genuinely participant led and, and being responsive to that. I think that's something that's often um, 
deprived to a lot of people, but particularly in all contexts to young people uh, who are assumed kind of not to have the right questions, but actually um, it, yeah, it's really important to be guided by youth voices. Thank you, Shovan. Um, any, any other question, reaction or? If, if there is one, we can maybe take one, uh, one last question. No. Or if, if yeah, if you be Andrea or Shoban, you want to add anything, something? Or, or, or is it possible to ask one question maybe? Of course. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, yeah. I want to uh, know uh, in, uh, it's a very interesting project anyway. That's uh, fantastic, congratulations. Um, I want to know, uh, you know, what kind of theories, feminist theories, that uh, you uh, applied or you exercised in in this project framework. I want to know the theoretical aspect of the the project. So uh, if, if I know that, uh, it will be it will be fine. So if you want to reflect on that, thank you very much. The sound was a bit faint, but I think you were asking about feminist theories we applied, right? Yes, Did I yes. That? Okay. Yeah. I think, you know, um, there's several, um, and uh, we can bring out a few highlights, and I think all of us touched a little bit on some of those highlights. For instance, um, I centered decolonial feminist theories as... Um, uh, central to our engagement, and I spoke of, uh, for instance, Maria Rugones um, as um, uh, one of the theorists uh, uh, we drew on. Uh, but you know, are you me or your own K? You know, some um, uh, various other um, uh, uh, theorists uh, we drew on. Uh, but you know, um, there's not one particular. Um, kind of form of feminism uh, we deployed because, you know, um, there's no one form anyway. And because the project was so diverse and vast and uh, traversed over a period of so many years, uh, it meant uh, that we brought in um, uh, various um, uh, theoristic interventions or framing or developed our own um, uh, from the actual uh, lived experiences uh, we were um, uh, um, working with to uh, further um, uh, this theoretical uh, terrain. Uh, I think Andrea shared one of the books uh, we've published in, but we have numerous publications out uh, that speak to um, uh, these various theories and, and interventions. Thank you, Phoebe. Uh, th there is, um, I don't know if you want to add something maybe very quickly, but there's also another uh, another question in the chat. So maybe we try to do it in uh, four or five uh, minutes in order to close the event then. Just super quickly, I was gonna say, uh, it's a great question, huge question. I'm gonna put in the chat some links to one to the general project site, one to the exhibition and one to the course that uh, Andrea was showing. And I think that uh, especially with theory that's so nutty and 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 grand, uh, you know, great. There's a great expanse of it. That's the best way to kind of uh, explore there. But I'll put those links in the chat. Uh, I can uh, just add to some of these final questions that are coming in. Um, indeed, the, there is that reference of our um, reading rooms that we created in those courses, and many of the references that Phoebe brought in as well. 
And I just like to add this, uh, of course, we had our thread references mostly uh, from our own Brazilian uh, production, uh, many of which are not translated. Um, but we also understood that uh, each of us came with certain theoretical um, orientations, um, but that uh, ultimately we worked really hard to create uh, the conditions so that our research subjects, our research collaborators, uh, were the theorists actually of the process. So um, within the decolonial uh, cartographic methods, we essentially try to systematize the concepts that the research subjects generate uh, in the process of them constructing their own um, research agenda and project, right? So uh, after a few years of, of, of accompanying, for example, um, the artistic residencies where um, they were thinking about problems like masculinities, for example, uh, the concepts that uh, ac actually uh, ended up being included, for example, in the academic articles and so on that I published, were concepts that emerged from their own experimentations uh, in this process. So we also like to challenge that idea that theory is something, it, it's a thing that necessarily we apply to distance, but that we can also think theory is in action uh, and, in, and, and try to create the conditions so that our collaborators are ultimately theorizing as well about uh, what they're um, what they're doing, um, and then sort of to connect with this question about you know beyond uh, uh, gender studies, I think ultimately these methodological orientations we we can we ended up using uh, in the Brazilian project, for example, gender much more as a lens than as an object of analysis. Um, understanding as well that in different communities, the ways that we speak about gender is really different. So we didn't come in with a set vocabulary of let's talk about gender. We came in with what are the problems that uh, uh, you face? And then I ended up mobilizing gender and racialized territorialized lens to from there um, develop a research agenda. And a lot of the times the propositions weren't even explicitly framed in terms of gender but a gender lens got us there. So I think there's lots of different ways that we can think about these, um, these relationships, yeah. Many thanks, Andrea, and thank you, Shoven, for uh, sharing these resources in the, in the chat. Um, so I suggest we close the, the discussion here because we, we try to keep the, um, we do not want to make it too late for uh, people who kindly joined us. And so I really want to thank again our three uh, speakers. This was uh, really uh, interesting and thanks for your time. Thanks for everyone um, who joined us. Uh, I just want to say a last word uh, about the next Agenda Spring Conference that will take place in Istanbul. Uh, at Kadir Has University um, on the 4, 6 September 2023. And the call for paper is open until uh, the 15th of May. So you can check the 10 strands on the conference website uh, that Agaliki will put in the chat very shortly. So here it is. So you can check this website with uh, for, for all the information about the conference. Uh, thanks for joining. We look forward to seeing you to a next ECR event or maybe in person to the to the conference, hopefully. Uh, thanks, everyone. And thanks, Andrea, Phoebe, and Siobhan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you. for having us. <laughs> yes, it was wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.